Mm, that's drunk. Hello, let's take a look at some more NES games that never received any kind of Super Nintendo follow-up. For example, in past videos I've talked about popular stuff like DuckTales and Crystallis, and lesser-known stuff like Astyanex and Worm Journey to the Center of the Earth. With a lot of these titles, I think most people just wanted to see more of these games, kind of like what we got with Contra or Mega Man on Super Nintendo, but in many cases, some NES games were just ahead of their time and too ambitious for their own good that really could have used the extra space to flesh out their ideas on a 16-bit console. One game that straddles the line between both those talking points is Capcom's Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Sure, the NES did get its own sequel, but on the Super Nintendo, we could have potentially seen more levels, bigger sprites, and an even better representation of the Rescue Rangers universe. The game was also ripe for bigger ideas, like for example, imagine a four-player version of this game where you could play as Chip, Dale, Monterey Jack, or Gadget. Yeah, the game probably would run a bit on the slow side if Capcom were able to pull it off at all, but hey, Konami was able to put together a Tiny Toons 4 player game that ran really well, granted it was just a series of mini games in Tiny Toon Adventures Wacky Sports Challenge, but I'm just saying, the Rescue Rangers world really could have had a lot more going on if it got a Super Nintendo game. Speaking of animated TV series, Felix the Cat got kind of a surprising revival sometime in the early 90s and it led to a really solid NES game. It's a typical side-scrolling platformer, but as you collect these Felix icons throughout the game, he can upgrade his bag of tricks to go from a punch glove to a motorcycle to a tank, and some upgrades allow you to float around in mid-air and some allow you to swim. The catch here is that there is a time limit for how long you can stay in each form, represented by the hearts in the upper left. There's a lot of good ideas in this game that could have easily been expanded upon in a 16-bit version, and a lot of different directions you could go. You could either keep going with vehicle upgrades, with stuff like fighter jets or a submarine, or you could go full Kid Chameleon and give Felix a bunch of alternate forms he could turn into. Either way, this is a fun playthrough that's worth checking out and was definitely worthy of a sequel. Of course, I gotta talk about the infamous Little Samson. Unfortunately, the price of the loose cartridge of this one costs well over $1,000 and has become little more than a status symbol for collectors, but beneath all the nonsense, there's actually a pretty dang good game there. You play as four different characters that you can switch between at any time, and the level design does an excellent job playing to the strengths and weaknesses of all four. For instance, one character can walk on spikes but can't jump very high, another can climb walls and ceilings but doesn't have much health. You get the idea. Again, like Felix the Cat, this this game's universe could have been expanded even further by introducing even more characters, or maybe even switch from a password system to a battery save, so each character could have their own stats that you could build up. Little Samson is great on its own, but a 16-bit sequel could have potentially been even better. Next, there's a game called Silent Service, made by Rare, and it's a submarine sim made by Sid Meier, the same guy behind games like Pirates and Civilization, so this game should be awesome, right? Well, yeah, it's pretty dang good on other platforms, but on the NES, it's a bit of a mess. You start the game, you get a list of scenarios to pick from, then, uh, what the heck is going on? Yeah, unfortunately, the user interface here is pretty crappy and not very intuitive, unlike the menu system that was in Pirates, which was pretty straightforward. This game is pretty dang cool once you get the hang of it, but I think both Silent Service and its sequel, Silent Service 2, would have been better served on the Super Nintendo. Amagon has you playing as a marine sent to investigate an island full of monsters. It's a side-scrolling run-and-gun that loves the color magenta for some reason, since your clothes, your hair, and even your bullets are straight from the old Crayola electric palette. In fact, Crayola.com describes this color as purple pizzas? I think they're going for pizzazz there, but anyway, Amagon is a strongly mediocre game, featuring one-hit deaths with the hook being that you can find a power-up that gives you a life bar and turns you into Super Macho Man from Punch-Out. Just press select and suddenly you're shirtless with Sergeant Slaughter's chin. The level and enemy design here is as generic as it gets, but still, there's enough weirdness and goofiness here that I can't help but think a 16-bit follow-up would have corrected some of the problems here and at least end up better than stuff like Realm or Time Slip. Ninja Crusaders is yet another side-scrolling action platformer where you play as a ninja, not to be confused with Ninja Gaiden, Shadow of the Ninja, Kid Nicky, Radical Ninja, Ninja Kid, The Last Ninja, Little Ninja Brothers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, so yeah, it's easy to see why this one was lost in the shuffle. This one was developed by NMK, who did some pretty dang good games for the Game Boy, like the two Roland's Curse games, and quality arcade shoot-'em-ups like Zedblade. And sure enough, this game is a pretty solid two-player co-op game that's got some oddball mechanics here, like being able to 
turn into a dragon or a scorpion thing, along with a couple other forms. The big problem with this game is that it is laughably difficult. I'm talking one hit death, start the level over from the beginning, no checkpoints. Plus, there's tons of enemy respawning and lots of other annoyances. This game really could have used a 16-bit follow-up just to give it a little more polish because the nuts and bolts for a good game are definitely here. Another solid NES title is Kickmaster, where you defeat enemies using kicks, of all things. I mean, of course you do. Would you think you use your face? This is a pretty ambitious title that features tons of items and power-ups. When you defeat an enemy, they give three different drops you can choose from before they disappear, and there's a ton of different moves you can learn as you progress through the game. There's a sliding kick, a roundhouse kick, they even work a knee drop into the proceedings, and you execute each move by pressing a direction on the D-pad along with both B or A. This game would have gotten a fantastic fantastic follow-up on the Super Nintendo because, hey, more buttons on the controller means more moves. Back forward then X could do some kind of crazy Street Fighter style kick, you could do a Liu Kang style bicycle kick. Seems like Kickmaster was just scratching the surface when it comes to educating your character's feet. Speaking of kicking, here's Kickle Cubicle made by Irem, another game predicated on kicking stuff and it somehow doesn't involve soccer. The gameplay has your character use their ice breath to freeze an enemy, turning it into a block, which you can then kick to get rid of other enemies or more importantly, form bridges to reach other parts of the map. Yeah, I know it feels like there's about a million phone games that have taken similar gameplay like this lately, but many of them lack the maps and the personality that Kickle Cubicle made. This is a puzzle game series that could and should have spawned a ton of sequels, similar to how the bomb Bomberman series went, featuring multiplayer and all sorts of different game modes, so I really think this game would have flourished on the Super Nintendo. Finally, A Boy and His Blob falls into the too ambitious for NES category. You play as a boy followed around by a blob from the planet Blobolonia. You feed it jelly beans to make it do different things depending on the flavor you give it, like vanilla turns it into an umbrella, tangerine turns it into a trampoline. It's a little bit like Kirby meets Pokemon, but not really. The thing is with the NES game is that there's a ton of unintuitive nonsense to deal with, and the level design isn't always up to snuff to deal with the blob's capabilities. A sequel, preferably on the SNES, NES would have gone a long way toward making this a really high quality puzzle platformer. Alright, that's all for now. I want to thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.